issues. Um, my name is Brittany Webster, and I am the um, manager of AGU's science policy and government relations team um, at AGU. Um, and I have been working with several members of our panel on spectrum issues for the past couple years, and AGU has been engaged on these issues since 2016. Um, continuously, this has been a learning process, um, both the technical issues and the um, policy landscape, because so much of it takes out takes place outside of the traditional science agencies that we think of. Um, but so, so excited to start this conversation today with our town hall, and we have five excellent speakers for you today. Um, and so we're going to start, um, our first guest speaker is, or our first speaker is going to be Dr. Jordan Girth, um, who is the chair of the American Meteorological Society Committee on Radio Frequency Allocations, which coordinates a continual science-based and enterprise-driven response to new spectrum allocation and sharing proposals. As the race for 5G has increased spectrum prospecting, new allocations and sharing rules could affect the accuracy of weather forecasts and the use of weather satellite data. With 15 years ex experience or 15 years developing expertise in passive remote sensing science, Jordan is a physical science and leverage observations lead at NOAA's National Weather Service Office of Observations which where he serves as an agency subject matter expert for the scientific and operational applications of satellite imagery and products. He is also an honorary fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Space Science and Engineering Center and a longstanding member of the AMS Committee on Satellite Meteorology, Oceanography, and Climatology. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jordan. Thank you so much, Brittany. Happy to be with you and virt even virtually, <laughs> hope everybody's doing well. I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, and frame this issue of the prospect of 5G signal interference with meteorological observations. I would just like to note uh, several of the other panelists here are members of the AMS Committee on Radio Frequency Allocations. We have a Twitter account and a website if you're interested in some more information. I would like to break down uh, this issue into really two components. And the first one is a matter of observations. The second is a matter of transmissions. Uh, we're going to talk about a a situations where 5G radio frequency interference can actually interfere with our ability to sense the atmosphere. There's also issues with transmission and getting the data down from the satellite or rebroadcast through satellite transmissions to reach end users. I also like to point out because this is an evolving issue, this is not really a matter of uh, today there's nothing, tomorrow it's a major problem. This is going to evolve over time. There's going to be a risk of inconsistency. It's not a sudden decrease in forecast skill or a complete loss of observations. However, it could interfere with our ability to deliver consistent weather services. So people are, are more uncertain than typical about the accuracy of their weather predictions. There are similar but different issues and I'd like to just briefly talk about the differences. Some of the issues with this 5G matter are related to the L band. So that is a transmission issue, 1675 to 1680 megahertz sharing. That's the satellite to ground transmission for NOAA GOES. That's the geostationary satellite that NOAA operates. The primary uses of GOES are not only to take imagery and provide situational awareness of weather for operational meteorologists, but for the computation of cloud track winds, so you need consecutive images and to relay remote weather station data. Um, the potential impact of interference with the 1675 or from 1675 to 1680 bleeding over into the adjacent parts of the ghost uh, transmission spectrum is a loss of data to users that are receiving the relay or the rebroadcast and an increased reliance on terrestrial delivery, which complicates things during emergency response when there may not be power or internet access readily available in some areas, as, and especially at high speeds. Federal users are likely to receive coordination options, as tricky as those are. Other users from industry and academia are not. The alternative is to rely 
on other satellites for that relay, which could be an expensive option. Now you'll hear Dave Lubar in a moment talk more about 24 gigahertz, but I want to distinguish that in that that is about collection. That is about the atmosphere that we are sensing. NOAA has satellites that sense in that band the pose JPSS. There are also other microwave frequencies at play or potentially at play in the future when it comes to uh, adjacent 5G operations. Um, we use 24 gigahertz in the National Weather Service for sensing uh, the atmosphere and looking at storms. It's like a CAT scan, if you will, and also input into numerical weather prediction models. So I'll just uh, show you where approximately we are. GOES operates in the visible and infrared, and our microwave spectrum is just adjacent to that. There are many different satellites that I have frequencies, as I talked about. 23.8 gigahertz has been in the news recently. However, there's spectrum proposals for varying frequencies, uh, uh, varying higher frequencies. Um, not all of these are in threat, but these are the, these are the frequencies that we are physically tuned our satellites to use. This is an example of what radio frequency interference looks like in the microwave. You can see Washington, DC. You can see New York City, the signals here. Sometimes it's less obvious what is radio frequency interference. This is what interference looks like with the previous generation of GOES. You see striping through the imagery. And if you compare that to the more digital signal from the GOES-R series, you can see what would be blocks in the data. And this was a severe storm case. You essentially just lose that segment of the imagery, which, provides, which is challenging for meteorologists to use because you'd like to see a nice animation of storms developing. And then lastly, uh, don't forget about the RAWs, the remote automatic weather stations, particularly out west, which uh, help uh, the wildland firefighters uh, get a sense of the uh, near fire conditions. And these are relayed through GOES and downlink to emergency management agencies and other users. It's a big use of GOES. And in some cases, when we lose GOES uh, due to a technical anomaly, uh, we hear about uh, this loss of data more than any other. So I'd just like to summarize in that, in general, from the perspective of the AMS Committee on Radio Frequency Allocations, we're seeking that, the, uh, that satellite weather data be timely, consistent, and reliable, and that the value of microwave weather observations is not achievable through other means. That is one of the only data sets that we have that is global and tells us important information about water vapor for weather and climate needs. And also, it's extremely important to maintain the observing capabilities and also the open data sharing policies that radio frequency uh, allocations for weather satellites afford. And that affects both the quality of local and global weather forecasts. So thank you for your time. And I look forward to the other panelists. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, so our next speaker is David Lubar, who's a spectrum management specialist in the civil systems group of the Aerospace Corporation. Mr. Lubar supports radio spectrum topics associated with environmental satellites and customer small satellites, where he advises the Joint Polar Satellite Program, better known as JPSS, and the Geostationary, Geostationary Operational Environment Satellite Series R or GOES-R programs. His over 40 years of engineering experience is dominated by spectrum support for space systems and associated ground segments. Mr. Lubar holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a master's of engineering degree in engineering management from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He's a member of the AGU, the American Meteorological Society, the National Weather Association and Institute of Electrical and Electronical Engineers, or IEEE, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. Thanks, Dave, for being here. Thank you, Brittany. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss spectrum issues here at AGU. Uh, as you said, my name is David Lubar. I work spectrum management issues for space systems at the Aerospace Corporation. And Aerospace is a not-for-profit corporation that serves as a federally funded research and development center. Um, passive remote sensing from space that Jordan introduced uh, is an application quite unlike 
most other uses of the radio spectrum. Extremely sensitive instruments are measuring very weak emissions from the atmosphere, from which important parameters such as water vapor content, vertical temperature, or humidity may be determined. Now, no transmission is allowed in the specific spectrum where such measurements are made, but nearby users can have some signal emissions from outside the region, which could contaminate the passive frequencies. Regulations apply limits on how much energy can be seen by those neighbors, seen from those neighbors rather. However, there's been significant controversy in recent years associated with some frequency bands. Now, what are weather satellites measuring and why can't they obtain their data elsewhere is often a question that comes from outside the earth science community. The atmosphere doesn't have a remote control that might allow us to derive the operational scientific data elsewhere and just change channels. The sensitive measurements are a significant portion of the input data to supercomputer based numerical weather prediction models. Without good starting conditions from that data, these equations in those models cannot be resolved. So how much you ask do ground based 5G networks generate a signal that can be seen by space based sensors. Well, energy from the moving beams that track smartphones in millimeter wave frequencies can bounce off the ground off buildings or off terrain and move in an upward direction. Such out of band emissions from terrestrial transmitters can then be seen by passive instruments. Earlier this year, the House Science, Space and Technology Committee held a hearing on the spectrum management processes associated with how the out of band emissions limits in the 23.8 gigahertz integrated water vapor band were determined. I'm sure you'll hear more about this during this session. What other passive bands may have nearby neighbors from services. You know, in other words, we're talking about uh, all the publicity that 24 gigahertz got, but is that the extent? Well, Jordan showed a chart with a lot of other bands that are used for passive remote sensing. This slide shows a few other random examples, none of which have been fully evaluated by the scientific community to verify their allowed out of mission limits won't be seen by satellite based instruments. So, you know, there's many future satellite constellations that wish to use spectrum on either side of the 50.2 to 50.4 gigahertz vertical temperature passive band. And that's what you're seeing on the right side of this slide. But this, will the sheer numbers of these uplinks already pointing upward be seen by nearby passive sensors in space? There are some other things. I'm not really trying to call out any particular vendor or, or, or system here, just to point out that, you know, they may very well end up being good neighbors, but we don't know. So what does the interference mean for the weather community and the earth science community? Well, some levels of contamination are insidious. In other words, there may be enough there to alter the desired data measurements, but not enough to be readily identified that it's there in the data. So it's gonna change the data, but you don't know it's doing that. Currently today, there's no on-orbit capability to determine if a given passive sensor band is being contaminated from such emissions. As Jordan said, this is a slow process. It will evolve uh, overnight. Uh, not likely, it will evolve over time. It is important for the scientific community to understand these issues and to contribute to their, their voice to the discussion. I look forward to what the other panelists are going to have to say, and I thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important spectrum topic. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, so our next speaker is Renee LaDuke, who is the founder and principal of Norion Strategy based in Arlington, Virginia, where she helps her clients communicate about their weather, climate, and aerospace priorities to decision makers. Renee began her work in climate adaptation and anthropology as a Fulbright scholar, studying human interactions with wildlife in Malawi, Malawi Zimbabwe, and Botswana. Renee's focus on earth science and weather began in earnest as a presidential management fellow at NOAA, where she served as a civil servant for nearly a decade, advising two NOAA administrators on the agency satellite programs together with Congress and the White House. Renee is an active member of the American Meteorological Society, serving as a member of its International Affairs and Radio Frequency Allocation Committees and on its board on enterprise economic development. She will receive the AMS's Keith Spengler Award for Service to the Weather Enterprise in January 2022. She's an advisory council member to the Millersville University Department of Earth Sciences and a board member of the National Spectrum Management Association. 
She graduated from Bates College with a BA in biology and anthropology and a master's of public policy with a focus on international policy at American University. Um, welcome, Renee. Great, thank you so much, Brittany, and thanks to all of the other panelists today. Glad we were all able to get together in both the virtual as well as the in-person spheres. I am, um, I, I really um, appreciate the comments of both Jordan and Dave to, talk, to speak more about the technical concerns that certainly the larger earth science community has. I focus much more on the policy and politics inherent inside of these regulatory issues. And so, um, and, and so we have seen a certain amount of, of, of press focus specifically around the, uh, specifically around these concerns about, about spectrum and certainly all, all of their, all of their impacts on basically whether, to, whether specifically on weather prediction, but then certainly on hydrology as well. And um, a lot of press focus came in 2019, um, right around the time of the ITU's World Radio Conference. Um, but, but I just wanted to mention here that when thinking about really all of um, entities like say the ITU and certainly at really the US level um, focused on really the Federal Communications Commission as well as, as, well as the National, National Tele, Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, these are not the usual agencies inside of which really the earth science community engages. And so, and so I know that in my time of working on these topics now almost for 10 years and really in earnest over, over really the last five, um, I'm having to learn a lot as we go along in terms of how best to really influence specific regulatory policies and ensure that really the science community has a voice. And part of that is certainly through press, 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 press outreach and and but certainly related to congressional outreach as well. And so and so there have been a number of letters like this. This was a letter from earlier this year that was sent by AGU, AMS, and the and the National Weather Association to to chair uh, to chair Cantwell of um, who chairs all of the Senate Commerce Committee, specifically noting noting our ongoing concerns about these issues and specifically asking her to question the nominees of um, from both the FCC as well as from really the Department of Commerce, specifically asking them really to engage on the concerns of really the earth science community. But we're really pleased with all that Senator Cantwell has said about these topics. Actually, right in the opening statement of when Gina Raimondo was basically testifying uh, uh, specifically about her nomination to be the Secretary of Commerce, um, we were really happy that Senator Cantwell specifically noted her major concerns about how really the FCC, particularly inside of the previous administration, I'll use her words, ran roughshod over the concerns specifically on these issues that are critical to weather data and certainly impacting GPS as well as real-time weather satellite data specifically from GOES. And so, um, and so note that I am saying, saying, saying a bit about all of the US Senate side here. I'm really pleased that we have Jamie Thompson who will be joining us next uh, specifically from specifically from all of the House Science Committee, and I would say that I would say that the House Science Committee has taken some great great leadership as well on these on these on these topics. But this is a fairly new advocacy effort, and and there is always a great deal of education to really be done. 
And so these are some of the key organizations and, and, and various other entities that have really been involved in really advocating and advocating and basically educating specifically on these topics over the past few years. You will note private sector entities like AccuWeather and DTN, as well as a number of the commercial space um, companies that are focused on GPS radio occultation, Spire, Planet IQ, and GeoOptics. We certainly have all of the university community as well. Um, I, I do really need to cite the leadership of all of the University of Wisconsin at Madison and all of their space science and engineering um, 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 center. They have really provided some great leadership and really speaking out about the importance of these of these of these topics. And um, and certainly all of, and so and so certainly a great deal of thanks go to you car as well and so but we're very interested in getting more university engagement on these topics i know that this is probably a new realm for basically your government affairs offices and really your professors to really get engaged with however though even just signing on to a letter can make a great deal of difference inside of oftentimes highly complicated FCC regulatory processes. And so how can we help as part of a larger earth science community? Number one is staying informed. You know, um, these topics are changing all the time and, and being able to understand the full extent of really the impacts is also changing a lot. And so, and so we do have regular town hall discussions on these topics. Happy to be doing the first one at basically AGU this year, but we have a number of them that happen at AMS meetings, as well as at the National Weather Association. If there are other meetings that you think that we should be doing outreach to, particularly inside of the hydrology community, we would welcome those suggestions. Also continuing to do congressional outreach, certainly noting all of the universities again, thanks very much to really the University of Wisconsin, but certainly universities inside of other states as well can really communicate in a very compelling way about this and we're happy to assist you inside of that process. And then certainly FCC engagement, writing or signing on to letters to basically the FCC about the value of spectrum for earth observations and other earth science applications. And so if you're interested in getting more engaged or if you're like, I don't know if I can write a letter, but, but happy to assist, um, here, is, here, is, here is my information and I'm also happy to talk afterwards. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. Um, before we get started with our next speaker, I do want to mention um, we will be taking questions afterwards. So if you are online, please feel free to type test, type questions in the chat and we will get to them. Um, and our next speaker is Janie Thompson, um, who is the subcommittee staff director for investigations <laughs> and oversight for the U.S. House Committee on Science, Space and Technology under Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson um, from Texas. Prior to returning to the committee in 2019, she was a lobbyist on clean energy and technology policy at Cassidy and Associates. She also served in the Office of Congressional Inter Intergovernmental, Relation Intergovernmental Affairs for the US Department of Energy under President Obama, and as a research assistant for the Science Committee's Energy and Environment and Investigation and Oversight Subcommittees under Chairman Bart Gordon from Tennessee. Janie holds an MS in Engineering Management and Systems Engineering from George Washington University and a BA in Philosophy from Swanee, the University of the South. She's a native of Knoxville, Tennessee and lives in Washington, DC with her husband, Tyler and three small children. And with that, we'll turn it over to Janie. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, so I'll just set the table real quick to talk about uh, Chairwoman Johnson and the committee's interest in this matter. Um, so, you know, we're thinking about how spectrum management has major implications for both discovery science and operational science activities that affect the daily lives of all Americans. And we're tracking closely on both fronts. Um, we care a lot about the potential impacts to environmental observation, radio astronomy research, and weather forecasting 
activities within the agencies that fall within the committee's remit. So that would be NOAA, NASA, National Science Foundation and DOT, um, and there's a scattering of other spectrum equities within other federal science agencies. Um, but we also care about the potential impacts to privately funded and university research and our science activities as well. So, you know, everything's about balance when we approach an important policy issue like this. And we certainly recognize the importance um, and the economic opportunity of 5G development, which is sort of what you really see coming along, um, increasing demand for spectrum. But we just have to be really thoughtful about how we proceed and make sure that as we deploy new technologies, we don't threaten the critical earth and space science observation activities. Uh, so Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas, who is the, her counterpart on the Republican side of the aisle, have been working hand in hand very closely to evaluate these issues and address these concerns for several years. And we continue to collaborate with, uh, really closely, which is um, really nice when we can achieve that. So just to go back briefly, um, we've done a few things. We, the committee really started to tune in on the whole saga of the 24 gigahertz spectrum auction at the beginning of 2019. Uh, so the leadership then of NASA and NOAA wrote a letter to FCC in February of 19 saying, we think your upcoming auction FCC is going to threaten the critical earth science activities um, in the 23.6 to 24 gigahertz band, which was adjacent to some uh, spectrum they planned to auction in 24 gigahertz for telecom use. Um, of course, this band supports JPSS at NOAA, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission at NASA, and a bunch of other important things using passive sensing. So uh, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas wrote a letter to FCC a few weeks later, actually asking them to halt the auction the night before, uh, pending more information about its potential harmful interference impacts on science activities. They did not um, halt the auction. They went forward the next day and FCC sort of replied and said, you know, we haven't seen any validated studies or sound engineering that um, validates the concerns that you have from these science agencies. So this um, outstanding intra-agency, interagency argument at that point. Um, in the fall later that year, Ms. Johnson sent a letter to FCC in which she released the previously unreported studies from NOAA and NASA that did support their concerns about the out-of-band emission limits uh, that could threaten activities in the 23.6 gigahertz band. Um, and then of course, a couple months later, the United States went to the World Radio Conference of 2019 in which they negotiated a whole manner of things with yeah. other nations. But that included service rules for the 24 gigahertz yeah. band. Um, and happily, the results from that international negotiation came out with something that was quite a bit more stringent than what FCC had put together on its own. So we were sort of happy about that. Uh, but now we're waiting to see FCC conform and resolve its service rules for the domestic use of that band. Uh, to agree with what we said we would do with our international partners. So this is all very wonky, but it's, it's an interesting. You had sort of an international negotiation and a domestic one happening sort of at the same time. Um, other things we've done recently, we had a request to the Government Accountability Office uh, who did an excellent report on how the federal government resolves interference issues and ensures that spectrum is available to meet all manner of needs for different stakeholders, including science users. Um, we did have an excellent full committee hearing this past July and Dr. Luber and Dr. Girth were um, witnesses for us. Renee gave us a lot of support in setting that up and helped elevate the issue for members. We had a lot of really um, good plug in participation from both sides of the aisle. Um, and then most recently, we've written back to FCC again, um, encouraging them to conform the out-of-band emission limits for the 24 gigahertz band with the things that we agreed to do at the World Radio Conference in 2019. And we've also written to uh, the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Eric Lander, to ask for the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology to opine on science needs and how the federal government conforms its approach 
on spectrum needs for various users. So we have a number of things we're looking at uh, going forward, but I will maybe get a chance to talk about them during the dialogue, uh, but trust that you know, we see how important this is. We wanna protect the investments that we've made in federal satellites and the investments that the private sector and university sector have made in their own research tools. Uh, so we're gonna remain very focused on this and looking out for the high stakes for the weather and our science community going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Janie. Um, and so now we're coming to our last speaker, um, Albin Kashevsky. Sorry, it's so hard to say for me. Um, is professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Colorado at Boulder and director of the CU Center for Environmental Technology. He received the PhD. He received a PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1989. Previously, he received the MS and BS degrees in electrical engineering and a BS degree in mathematics from Case Western Reserve University. Um, and from 1989 to 1997, he was a faculty member at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. From 1997 through 2005, he worked for the US, he worked for NOAA's Environmental Technology Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, where he became chief of ETL's Microwave Systems Development Division. He has developed and taught graduate courses on electromagnetics, antennas, remote sensing, instrumentation, and wave propagation theory. Professor Gashevsky is a co-founder and chief scientist of Orbital Microsystems Incorporated. And Professor Gashevsky is a fellow of the IEEE and founding member of the IEEE Committee on Earth Observation. He is a member of the American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, the International Union of Radio Scientists, Tau Beta Phi, and Sigma Phi. Sigma. I don't know. From 2009 to 2011, he served as chair of USNC URSI Commission. And with that, welcome Professor Gashevsky. Thank you very much, Brittany. Well, first of all, uh, thanks everyone for attending today. And I, I wanna point out that I come at this problem uh, as a technologist, as a technologist with almost 40 years of interest in radio wave propagation and remote sensing and a technologist who began his career not after, not long after, I should say, uh, the first work in 1979, when frequency allocation was uh, considered on a, a serious level globally. And since then, I can only say that the march of technology has uh, permitted transmissions at higher and higher power levels, further and further up the spectrum, uh, to the significant detriment of virtually all of the passive services. Radio astronomy, passive, Earth remote sensing for weather forecasting, and even other passive applications, all weather landing, it, various other uh, sundry applications you might find. When I started my career, all we had to worry about in interference was perhaps 60 Hertz in the laboratory. That's not true today. Today, if you go into any laboratory environment and even environments very far away from the laboratory, you'll find radio emissions all the way up to in the spectrum, 77 gigahertz automobile radars, radars being planned for around 150 gigahertz. This incessant march of technology needs to come with it. Some means of understanding how we can coexist as well as the best means we can develop of technology that will ensure that this coexistence can happen. And so it's not all political, it's not all technological, it's a union of both those two issues. And so it pleases me greatly to talk a little bit today about SpectrumX, which is uh, the first engineering research center from NSF that's focused on the development of spectral coexistence, spectral efficiency, 
and a variety of other technology and policy measures that we hope are gonna help solve this problem. It is primarily an academic activity. There are 41 faculty that are leading Spectrum X for a variety of different organizations. As you can see here, we've got representation from a number of partners, minority serving institution partners as well, because Spectrum is not just for particular folks who've been working in the field. Spectrum is something that's needed for everyone's value, everyone's commerce. We also have a number of unfunded collaborators who are working with us, companies, institutions, et cetera. And what we are intending to do is in primarily four areas, develop coexistence and spectral efficiency measures. One of them is first of all, in looking at use cases, not just weather sensors and communication systems, but active remote sensing in communication systems and comm systems and comm systems. They also have interference problems that are growing. We're gonna be looking at those use cases and from those use cases, driving where our RF wireless and networking technology efforts are gonna be leading. And so there will be basic R&D on developing interference mitigation and various technologies that will allow the use of spectral bands more efficiently. Along with this, there is economics and policy that will be driving these. Where are the most significant problems from the standpoint of economics? Clearly, weather forecasting is one of them. And this is even more so going to be the case in years ahead as climate is changing. Finally, we're gonna be applying technologies that weren't all around at all at the beginning of spectrum allocation, and that is machine learning and AI technologies. And these technologies are growing rapidly. Question becomes now, how can we use these technologies in conjunction with spectrum usage measurements that would allow us to, in some sense, organize how people are using the spectrum and provide directions? Notice I'm not using the word regulation. Direction, I think, is the better word to use in this regard. We do this right now with traffic cameras. And as a public service, there's information on traffic that people use day in and day out in order to determine how to efficiently get around town. Well, why can't we do the same thing with Spectrum? So these are just a few ideas on how we wanna proceed in applying technology through the academic community to Spectrum coexistence. And I'll be happy to answer questions as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaszewski. Um, personal note, happy to see all the MSI partners on here, especially the US Virgin Islands, which is where my family's from. So really interesting. Um, so we've had a couple of questions in the app, but also happy to take questions from the room or in the chat if that's easier for folks. But I'll start with this first question we have, which is how great is the encroaching threat to G GPS? GPS intersects with literally every focus group at AGU far beyond hydrology. I can take that one. Um... At least, at least, at least initially. Um, inside of inside of Jordan's presentation, he he spoke about the threats to basically the L band, and and basically um, GPS certainly relies upon L band just as just as NOAA's goes goes satellites do, and so. Um, and so there there has been a proposal by a company by the name of Legato Networks. Um, previously known as Light Squared, that has proposed to either 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 operate very close to or basically um, overlap operations uh, together in key areas of basically the L band. And one of those areas is areas that are that that specifically the GPS community are very much focused on. Um, and and there is actually a larger. Um, a larger coalition of basically a bunch of different organizations, including a number of earth science organizations that are very focused on that. 
and and the name of that entity is called the Sat, uh, is, is called the Satellite Safety Alliance. If you Google that, you will you will find you will find all of their website, and you'll find more information about really the impacts specifically on GPS. However, there are some significant concerns about how it could impact aviation. Um, as well as a lot of other GPS applications. Um, speaking specifically of geodesy, I know that there are some concerns inside of really the geodetic community. Um, I've recently been in touch with UNAVCO about this, largely, largely because I know that they have the potential to be significantly impacted by that. Um, there is currently a National Academy study going on, uh, specifically looking at the impacts on GPS as well as of satellite communications of basically an FCC decision on this last year. Um, all of that effort is basically ongoing. I know that the earth science community is going to be briefing all of that National Academy study, and I believe that UNAVCO as well as the surveyors will as well. Thanks, Renee. Um, you just touched on this a little bit, um, but if anyone else wants to respond, seconding the GPS inquiry, but also wondering more about the broadly, more broadly about the impact on other ge geodetic satellite uses. Sure. Um, I I do know that um, there are a number of different entities involved inside of that same coalition, which I basically mentioned, which is which is again called the Satellite Safety Alliance. Um, I know that the positioning, uh, the the, re the resilient positioning, navigation, and timing um, foundation is involved. I'm not completely sure I have that name correct. Um, however, though, they are also noted um, inside of the Satellite Safety Alliance. Also, the GPS Industry Association is very involved with that, and. Um, and 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 certainly and certainly UNAVCO. I don't have a great deal of under I, I I don't have a great deal of expertise on that. However, in terms of a liaison point of view, that's that that is the information that I have. There's probably one other good source, and that is the GPS.gov, uh, the information from the Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Advisory Board. Thanks, Dave and Renee. Um, so question here, what is the current state of our information sharing and information infrastructure in having real-time visibility into spectrum usage in order to inform policy decisions or direction? Yeah, I, I can respond to that. Um, we really have very little uh, real-time countrywide, nationwide, means of observing usage of the spectrum. Uh, we had approached this problem of needing even just a research grade facility to observe spectrum usage about 25 years ago. And it's been on people's minds ever since and it sounds like a good thing to do and it yet has never been done. It can be done, it's not that difficult and in fact, with some of the modern software defined radio technology. Uh, there are actually companies that are building SDRs that are very capable of providing this kind of information. We are able to monitor spectrum throughout the country uh, in a way that uh, would be extremely useful for management. Um, at this point, again, uh, we, don't, we don't have any consistent system for doing that, but uh, the technology is available to do that. Uh, to monitor the spectrum, it's, it's a measure of radiation coming from a number of different directions, three different directions, three dimensions, and then also measuring it across frequency and time. This is, again, very well suited to some of these radios. There's also a new technique that's being developed called coherent spectrum monitoring, which not only would allow receivers at various locations to measure radiation coming in, but also to localize to some extent where that radiation is being emitted from effectively by triangulation. So these new technologies are coming down the line and I think they're gonna be very valuable in the near future. Thanks, Al. Um, Dave Lubar implied more than the 23.8 gigahertz band is at risk. What can NOAA do to protect at risk passive bands? 
Well, first of all, I'll say I don't speak for Noah, but uh, um, you know the 24 gigahertz uh, discussion and studies, um, you know, certainly got a lot of examination and a lot of public discussion. But you know, there are other RF signal types uh, that are even in closer proximity to other sensitive passive bands. Uh, in the case of 24 gigahertz. Um, the nearest 5G um, terrestrial systems are at least they're 250 megahertz away from the edge of the passive band. Um, but one of the things I see are, are a great many services that basically bookend some of these bands with no spacing and, and do have signal sources that move in an upward direction. I don't, I, the one that comes to mind really are all of the so called V band. Uh, gateway uplinks and terminal uplinks that talk to a number of the new developing satellite constellations for internet connectivity. And there's, there's quite a few of them. So again, these issues are predicated in part upon the type of signal and the, the, the density of use. Um, there is a considerable difference between somebody's uh, mobile radio system that interferes with the local wireless mic in the uh, in, in an auditorium and the fact that uh, a whole number of systems generate enough energy that they can be sensed by a, a microwave radiometer with a particular footprint as it passes over the earth. So there's just a lot of pieces to this. I'd say 50 gigahertz is concerned. I'd say there are systems directly adjacent to the 36 to 37 passive band. I'm not saying they're all problems. I'm just saying we don't know. I can, I can follow up on that as well um, from basically a bit more of a policy and funding perspective. I, I think that it is, um, um, given that the question was sort of what can NOAA do? Well, I would say that NOAA, I know, is working hard. Um, and, and basically, of course, I don't work, work for NOAA, but I know that they're working hard inside of, inside of specifically um, um, within government channels to sort of express, express express all of their concerns about this but at the same time you know really really the FCC needs to hear from us as public stakeholders as well really to be able to express our concerns but of course it all is predicated on the fact that we know when the various different proceedings come out and when and when comment is and, and when comments are really uh, specifically are solicited inside of a highly complicated regulatory process. And so, and, so, and so we are doing our best as really an earth sciences community to try to get the word out at the moments that that becomes evident. However, though, I think it's just really important to be able to think now sort of, sort of what kinds of, which types of observations am I really most reliant on and thinking about, okay, so what spectrum does that really rely on? And basically in doing that proactive thought, particularly if you rely on the ATMS sensor, uh, specifically on the JPSS, um, um, specific to this question, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll really wanna reflect on that and be able to provide coherent stories about, okay, so this is how I use this information and here's the larger societal <laughs> benefit of really using all of that information. And it's exactly those kinds of stories written in a way that the attorneys at basically FCC understand, and I'm happy to help with that, um, can, can, then, can then really be helpful inside of, inside of really the process. Um, going further on sort of the what can NOAA do though, um, I think that there are various technologies that could possibly be added onto future JPSS satellites, specifically to do some greater monitoring related to what interference may be happening. Um, but being able to add those technologies requires proactive funding. And, and, so, and so that's why it's very important to communicate uh, specifically with Congress related to annual presidential budgets, but then also particularly when there happen to be disaster supplementals, et cetera, 
um, really to be able to communicate, it's incredibly important that we get funding for these, for these various different technologies. And, um, and I, um, um, Noah, Noah is often constrained in how they can communicate about that. However, though, I, I have no problem saying that there are efforts to get things funded. And basically, if you rely on really the JPS satellite, you want to make sure that they can add some hardware onto those future satellites so that they can better monitor all of this type of interference. Thank you. Um, so I saw this too, but I haven't read too much about it. Um, any reaction to yesterday's testimony from major airlines on 5G impact on flight safety? I'll take that briefly, uh, just to explain what it is. Um, the, some of these proposals in the L-band frequency range uh, are in close proximity to radar altimeters. And uh, radar altimeters, of course, are installed on, on virtually every type of commercial aircraft, as probably as well as military aircraft. And like any other aircraft equipment, they've probably been some that have been there for a long time. So it's not necessarily something that you go up and replace. Uh, that's a, a mechanism to determine basically a precise measurement of where you are with respect to the ground. So there are concerns uh, that have been expressed uh, by the FAA uh, that uh, 5G installations, uh, especially near airports and things that might impede the takeoff and landing process that would cause some interference with those receivers. Um, it, it's another example of a, a technology that uh, perhaps the actual users weren't quite as front and center about you know, raising that very early on when some of these things were proposed. Having said that, some of the uh, aer aerospace uh, and, and aviation representatives have done an excellent job of flagging this issue. But again, you know, we're at the point where there's a public FCC proceeding and a federal agency saying, hey, wait a minute. Um, and if you don't think this affects everybody, it was a discussion this morning on the Today Show. Yes. Um, you, you said it, we should lobby for more funding and such to get these in on, on our missions. It takes probably um, a year or more to get the funding in. It takes a year procurement to get a mission, you know, uh, con contracted, and then probably a four to five year development cycle and uh, a launch campaign. I feel like we're working, we're a little behind the curve. We, <laughs> I, we need to, we need to uh, do this. We, we need to do it, but we need to do it faster. Can I follow? I, I, just very briefly, I, I totally agree that we need to do it faster. Um, however, though, I would say that given, given, given the fact that, you know, launches are happening quickly, we don't have to worry so much, well, you know better about the procurement processes um, uh, as basically the questioner than I certainly do, and the questioner is Otto Brugman, um, and and so and, and so yes, you know you know the timing really does matter. However, though, um, it it just has to be a unified voice coming out of NOAA, but then also NOAA needs to be able to convey enough information to those people who advocate for them specifically to be able to really have a unified voice in terms of saying this is an absolute priority. And so and so people and so people like Janie and her colleagues on really the appropriations committee can then can then really take action on it. However, I totally agree that we're very much in a place where where things are things are not moving quickly enough and, and basically and and given that it hasn't been mentioned here yet, um, all of the brand new iPhone, which just came out, has the ability to operate very close to 23.8 gigahertz. Yeah. And, and we are quite concerned about uh, how that will actually sort of 
sort out. We, we don't quite know, but it's a significant concern. And, and it, it really all comes down to the decisions of really the wireless companies as to how they're going to operate adjacent to that base. Yeah. <laughs> I May think I suggest, Otto, that I think your estimate of how long it takes to go through those processes is highly optimistic. I think it's probably twice that long. I but, agree, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I will point out that there are some bright spots. And some of this has to do with the rapid advance of small satellite technology and companies that are going into the commercial weather data provision business. They see opportunities and uh, they particularly don't how you say like to wait for the regulatory processes to take their, uh, their, their, their uh, effect in some sense. They have to go right for those opportunities because there's a competitive field. And a case in point, uh, and I will crassly say that as chief scientist of orbital microsystems, we were able to get up a small satellite demonstration in about two years preparation time, the entire mission was completed from design to scientific analysis for under two and a half million dollars. These are breaking cost models. And I think if we allow some of the, what you might wanna call technology development in spectral sensing to occur within the private sector, we might see those timescales shorten because the differences between what is typical in the procurement process and what I'm seeing in the private sector in the development of the commercial weather services is markedly different. Uh, order of magnitude in some cases, easily a factor of two. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I, we should talk afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, I should echo a little bit of what Al has to say. I agree that, that doing RF surveys by getting some small sat measurement payloads with some radiometers should certainly be a lot quicker uh, and I think that provides an ability to get some kind of an RF mapping of what's happening out there. Because at the end of the day, you just don't know where these emissions are occurring with enough density and it, with enough movement in an upward type direction that they could be seen by a sensor. But I also think that there's a, um, an excellent gold standard in having a device on an operational spacecraft. Um, and, and the scientific uh, application here is challenging because it involves a great deal of data because you're, you're going to likely, depending on the type of interfering signal uh, or contaminating signal, I should say, and remember these are emissions that aren't key to what the, the terrestrial system is trying to do, they're just simply out of band byproducts, um, may take a great deal of measurements with unique algorithms uh, where you break down the, the bandwidths into smaller chunks and you bend the data and uh, you know do computations on board. The ideal thing of course is to have the same RF path, the same geometry as what's being sensed, which does give some advantage to placing them on the operational satellites. But you know, this development is, is, as was pointed out, is so different in time scale than the development of a terrestrial system. You know, by the time you field some of these space-based systems that aren't small sat based, you're maybe on to the next generation. So I, I appreciate those comments that you need both for a solution in my opinion. Thank you. Um, so final question, a um, bit of an interesting question that it's definitely worth some thinking about. Um, what is the role of the National Space Council in resolving spectrum issues? I have, I have a point of view. <laughs> I think, yeah, from the Science Committee's perspective, I think we would really like to see OSTP and the National Space Council both um, take a more hands-on role in sort of understanding the potential threats to our science and space activities. Um, and really advocating at all levels of government for negotiated solutions that sort of look after, um, you know, the incumbent users and the new users equally. I mean, there, there's, such, there's such a big opportunity, um, an economic opportunity for folks who are seeking uh, to deploy in new bands that are being auctioned. And, you know, they, they're well organized and they certainly communicate with Congress and with the White House. And, 
you know, you want to make sure that all perspectives are being heard and you can really coordinate that whole of government approach. So certainly it's a good thing if you have folks like the National Space Council who are right there in the executive office of the president, um, plugging in and making sure that the equities of NASA, NOAA and private users are being looked after. And it's something we've been in conversations with them, for example, but it's your own has um, been speaking with them, so. Renee? Yeah, just a, just a very brief um, brief follow up to basically Janie Janie's 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 comments. I think that you know we we would welcome really the National Space Council's in engagement, um, especially given that they're in at the level of really the executive office of basically the president. And there are so many different. Um, um, factors and sort of influencers in play and and basically you know especially given that oftentimes really the wireless community um, is seen as a major driver of really all of the economy sometimes they can have a very large amount of policy sort of sway um, particularly at really the National Economic Council level and and basically I just think that it's incredibly important for really us to be communicating about the value of the science that we provide to basically society and, and, and really being able to make sure that that is part of the calculation as well when really decisions are made at really that executive office of the president level. Yeah. Thank you, Renee. Question, just in terms of that response, does the NTIA still play that role or are they just an effort? So the question for those online is, doesn't NTIA play that role? Well, the role of really the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, um, NTIA, is to essentially coordinate federal views around spectrum policies. But the thing is, is that when it comes down to sort of priorities of really the country, it can, I, I have found, and this, ha and this certainly happened with all of the 24 gigahertz issue, that, that, that really the sort of um, the seeming priority of the nation to deploy 5G and to compete with China sort of overtook everything and was seen as so much the, uh, was seen as so much the priority that they couldn't see that anything would be more than that. And I think that given that we were not so aware of all of the necessary processes to really sort of influence that, I think that in many cases, really the wireless community won out. But I think that when we're thinking about the area around 50 gigahertz, that's why we're preparing now to really make sure that we can communicate in the most compelling way possible. Let me just quickly add, I think the scientific input is what's really needed NTIA uh, does an excellent job regulating the federal agencies and representing them. But being a person that has, you know, 30 or 40 years of spectrum management experience and coming at things from that angle and looking at things that generally affect communication systems, um, these kind of measurements taken by a passive sensor by something that's not even a radio receiver, but is a, a, a radiometer or a square law detector aren't necessarily well understood by people with a communications engineering background. And so I have my feet kind of in both camps. And that's why it's important for us to urge this community to be involved, to get that scientific voice, to help balance out um, what is a typically standard regulatory process dealing with spectrum issues. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our um, panelists today for being here and speaking. And I hope I'm not speaking on a turn, but I think they would all be happy to continue this conversation um, as we move forward on these issues. Um, and also, if you're an AGU member, I'm also happy to talk with you more about these issues and how to engage with AGU on these issues. Um, thank you to our audience as well for being so engaged. Um, we are. I think really excited might not be the word, um, but we're really happy to see so many people engaged on this issue and interested in having a dialogue on this issue um, because it is, as all policy issues are, 
Um, it is going to take more than us. It's going to definitely take collective action for us to be able to see the kind of change and innovation we hope to see. Um, so thank you so much um, and enjoy the rest of your meeting.